get by. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fog, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same. And right now, I feel like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. And, you know, Drew, I always like to think back of who are some of the interesting episodes people should look at. And it's it's about the journey. And I remember uh, talking to Nolan Bushnell, who's the founder of Atari, and he talked about the ups and downs of that journey. And there was one point in the journey, you know, people see him as a founder of Atari and Chuck E. Cheese. He was Steve Jobs' mentor. So he talked about that. But he talked about how there was a point in the company that it was struggling and he had to basically move out of his house and they went on a worldwide trip with his family and they stayed with different families. The kids thought it was amazing, but they didn't realize they were doing that out of necessity, right? Yeah, and so yeah. it's often the behind the scenes stuff that we don't see because there's a lot of sacrifice that goes on and for, for founders that we don't realize, which we'll discuss right. on this. and. Um, before I introduce Drew McClellan, the Agency Management Institute, I uh, this episode is brought to you by Rise25. At Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their Dream 100 relationships by helping you run your podcast. And I have found, you know, the most important thing for me, Drew, is relationships. And I'm always looking at a way to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past over decade to have the people I admire, the companies I admire and profiling them and learning from them on my podcast so others can too. So if you've thought about starting a podcast the right way, um, you can go to rise25.com and check out more. We are an easy button. We handle everything, the strategy, all the implementation, all the execution. So check it out. I am excited. Uh, We have Drew McClellan and I followed his work for a, a long time. He's worked in advertising for over 25 years and he started his own agency, McClellan Marketing Group, in 1995. I want to know what the landscape was like in 1995. He also owns and runs the Agency Management Institute, which is a consultancy helping agency owners grow. And they've been doing that since the early 90s. And Drew's agency was a member of this organization and Drew took it over. And his first book also, 99.3 Random Acts of Marketing, was published in 2003. And he runs Build a Better Agency podcast. He's been interviewed, quoted in Entrepreneur Magazine, New York Times, CNN, Business Week, and many others. So, Drew, thanks for joining me. Uh, Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to the conversation. You know, um, I want to go back to 1995. Compare about the landscape then compared to now. And you have a really interesting, um, you know, vantage point because you see so many agency owners with the Agency Management Institute. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, certainly. I mean, it was a it was a completely different world. I mean, we didn't have social media. Uh, I can remember early conversations with businesses. Should they have a web page? I mean, you know, it was just a. When I say these kind of things, it makes me sound like I'm 97 and I've lived in a cave. But that's how quickly the landscaping, the landscape of marketing and advertising has changed. And one of the things I love about the business is we have to keep up. And so if you are somebody who likes to be challenged and keep learning and doesn't like to do the same thing every day, it's a great vertical for you because, you know, it doesn't matter what you knew five days ago because that's old hat. And so we're constantly pushing ourselves to learn new things. But yeah, it was a completely different world. Talk about the services, the evolution of services. So 95, I mean, I remember, I think I had a CompuServe maybe that was like 97, um, like email address, but so probably people weren't offering websites. What were the services you offered then? And what do you offer now? Yeah. I mean, we certainly offered some very rudimentary websites. Um, we've always been a B2B agency for the most part. Uh, and so, you know, it was lead gen and sales enablement and support. It was, we did a ton and we still do today. Even we do a ton of branding work where we really help, uh, businesses understand why, why or why they're not different and how they want to be different and what is it like to bake that into the organization. So it's not about the tagline or the logo. That's the tail that wags the dog. It's really about, you know, what kind of dog do you want to be and why, would, why do you want to be that? And then how do we actually infuse that through the organization? So we did a lot of that kind of work. Uh, we did a lot of uh, television and radio production. Um, 
you know, which we don't do very much of that anymore. You know, we're doing a lot of video, but it's not TV spots anymore for the most part. Um, you know, we did some trade show support, which we still do today. So some of the things are, are sort of evergreen, but, you know, as you can imagine, how we do them is very different, even if we do the same thing. Yeah. So we'll say radio TV 95 today, yeah. video yeah. published wherever YouTube and right. their website. And then lead generation, then was it like direct mail yeah. type of stuff? Okay. Or, I know, geek what? out on direct mail because you're, you're kind of a former copywriter. I am. Right. A, right, yeah. right. My, my origin story is I'm a writer. And so I grew up through the ranks of advertising and agencies, big and small as a copywriter. And then um, YNR, when I was working for them, had an interesting program where they, they, would make you a what they called a copy contact person. So you had client contact like an account person, but then you would go back and actually write the copy. So kind of like how PR works, right? Much more so than a typical advertising agency. So I sort of got um, connected to the whole idea of the strategy of what we were doing and why we were doing it. And I even today, I still love on the agency side of my world, I love knowing what we're trying to do and then sitting down and, and crafting it. And I certainly do that on the AMI side as well. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think um, you'll appreciate this, Drew. I think I've done over a hundred interviews with some of the top copywriters and direct response marketers. I think it's literally the foundation of, of most things, because when you talk about how to be different, like the copywriter has to pull out the nugget and the, right. and the <laughs> real gem and the hook of why people should buy or listen or whatever it is. And that's, right. So you were doing direct mail lead gen. What were yep. some of the stuff you were doing at the time? Oh, you know, we were doing some great three-dimensional direct mail where you would, you know, send part of something. And then if they wanted the other part of it, you know, they had to let you come see them. And, you know, Speak we were to doing me a on lot that. of that. Tell stuff. me about that. I, I could talk hours. Yeah. About, I would love to hear all the 3D mail. What was an example that you you sent out that was fun? Oh, you know, we would send, um, you know, like we would send a phone case. And if we got to have them call, they would bring a phone or, you know, it was like, we're giving you the, we're giving you the thing that's not that valuable and <laughs> sexy. And if you want the valuable thing, you know, like people are doing that now with iPads and things like that. I've not seen people do this actually. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. What and, are they doing? They're sending them a case and you meet with me, you get an iPad. Or one of the things agencies are doing is they are, um, with a proposal or a, a capabilities deck, they're sending it on an iPad. And then they're saying, you know, um, you know, if we can come talk to you, you can keep the iPad or, you know, you can leave it at the front desk and we'll come pick it up. So I, I, I people, I'll tell you what, a, my, a lot of my agencies that we work with are killing it with direct mail today. It's very different. Totally. It's, it's yeah. personalized. It's, you know, three-dimensional. It's, it's mixed with a digital component. So you're sending them a red Converse shoe and then the red Converse ad is following them around on the internet. So, you know, it's much more sophisticated than it was back in the early nineties. But the, the idea is the same, which is I want to get your, I want to do something that actually gets your attention. And I want to show you that if I can get your attention, I can probably help you get somebody else's attention. Yeah, no, I love hearing those fun because it just gets the creative juices flowing to hear right, right. you say, oh, send the case and the phone or leaving the right. iPad. Have you? And, and again, I, I think sometimes it could maybe backfire um, as well if you don't do it right. So sure. in those situations, would you say they get to keep it regardless or like if we do business together, you get to keep this? I, I mean, what well, have you have you seen any gone wrong, a lumpy mail gone wrong? It, it only goes wrong if it feels smarmy, right? So I, th I think it's like I right now I have a, an agency that we work with and they live in the building materials world. That's their niche. So they've got a great uh, biz dev program where they are, they went out and got real tools, right? Like saws and shovels and things like that. That uh, that they're using as a three dimensional direct mail piece. So you know, if somebody sends you a sho a shovel in the mail, and then you get a call and say, "Hey, I'm the guy that sent you the shovel," you're going to have a conversation, right? Hundred percent. And, and you're not going to throw away the shovel. Probably. And you're not going to throw away the shovel, right? So so yeah. this is going to be this constant reminder 
of this agency. And, and again, they're probably the same agencies you're bumping to into three months later at a trade show or something else. So it's just it's a very way, memorable. Yeah, it's just a way to get on somebody's radar screen in a way that sticks for a little while. Yeah. What's yeah. the coolest thing, Drew, that you have seen someone send or maybe you've received, been on the other end receiving? Yeah. So uh, I wish I had thought of this, but I didn't. So um, <laughs> one of our agencies was in a pitch for uh, a large manufacturer of refrigerators. So they went to a junkyard and they found an old refrigerator. They bought it and they just took the door. All they wanted was the refrigerator door. And then they had a bunch of magnets made with messages from their pitch. And they delivered the refrigerator door to the company with all of these magnets about, you know, how the refrigerator is the heart of the kitchen and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Ah, How do you not pay attention to an agency that sends you a refrigerator door with custom made magnets. I love it. Yeah. Um, so lead gen 95 direct response, lumpy mail yep. in the mail. Now today, what does it look like for the agents? Yeah. So for us, um, most of our clients sell something to a bank, a credit union, or an insurance company. So where I happen to live, Des Moines, Iowa, Nobody thinks about us this way, but we are like this hotbed of banks, credit unions, and insurance company. Uh, I had no offices. idea. Yeah. Uh, after Hartford, Connecticut, Des Moines is number two in insurance company uh, headquarters. So uh, my whole, I haven't lived here my whole life, but uh, when I started my agency, it was in Des Moines. And so we've, we've been constantly getting to know and bumping into banks, credit unions, and insurance companies. And how they buy and what matters to them is a very unique sort of cadence and, and language. And we've just gotten really good at it. So most of our clients, they might sell a white label uh, credit card or mortgage to, to credit unions. They might sell uh, teller drawers to banks. That's who our clients are. So, so we do a lot of, uh, you know, pre COVID, we were doing a ton of trade show work. We were doing, we were doing a fair amount of lumpy mail and sales enablement. Uh, we were doing a lot of uh, what I would call brand building because, you know, you would think a teller drawer is a teller drawer is a teller drawer. So what do they, what makes them different? So again, it was around the brand and what that brand stood for. Um, we, we do a fair amount of podcasts uh, for clients and other thought leadership things. You know, my latest book that came out in 2020, Sell with Authority, is all about how I believe uh, people need to sell today, which is from a position of authority uh, where you are an expert. And so people want to buy from you because you've already been super helpful to them. And so they sort of feel like they know you by the time they're ready to buy. So we we implement a lot of that methodology with our clients. And we have a unique um, sort of position with our clients, which is we think that most agencies spend their clients' money wrong. We think that most agencies spend their money trying to get new customers. And what we say is, you know what, 75% of your budget should be spent getting more money out of your existing customers. And we'll spend 25% getting you more great customers, but the best, easiest money you can get is more money out of your existing customers. And nobody pays attention to your existing customers, but our philosophy is- They're off to the new shiny- Right, right. always off for the new sale. But our thing is there's, it's so much easier to get incremental dollars from, and to get, set your hooks even tighter into an existing customer, that that's really where your marketing should be focused. So that's the kind of work we do. Do you also do digital for these clients too? Like, oh, sure. a, like paid ads and things like that? You bet. And we're doing, you know, SEO and PPC and, you know, um, <clears throat> retargeting and all of, all of that. I mean, honestly, today for an agency, that's sort of table stakes. If you're not doing that, it's pretty hard to be relevant to a client. But I think the mistake some people make is, that, and, and we certainly have seen this during COVID, where everybody abandoned all of their traditional marketing uh, efforts and went completely digital. And, and while I don't disagree, a good chunk of your money should be spent on digital. Uh, I think there are some tried and true, like direct mail, that are still very effective and very cost effective. And so it's, it's important for us as business owners and leaders to not be so enamored with the digital side of things that we assume that the analog side of the world doesn't exist anymore. 
Yeah, I would love to see if you still played in the radio space. Again, like it, it's probably the same with direct mail. Right. It's a lot of people aren't doing it because they think it's dead, right? right. So right. they could keep thinking that with direct yeah. mail, but it's it's also, like you said, a way to be different and stick out. And it seems like the way that, that you've been able to do be different and stick out is to really serve a specific niche, yeah. it sounds like. Yeah. Um, and so... I'd love to hear a story like with maybe the agency management Institute of, or maybe your client that how you, cause that's a really important piece of everything is how are you different? How are you unique? And you're showing your unique selling proposition. What was it like? Like tell, tell me one that was before and after like how they maybe position themselves or the messaging. Yeah. Um, what would be a good example where you like walk people through this, process of how to be different and what it looked like on the other side. Yeah. Well, so first of all, I, th I think, you know, again, leaning back on this idea of selling from a position of authority, you can't be an authority on everything, right? I mean, somebody is an authority on a thing or a topic or a whatever it is. And so I think a big part of sales in this century is about specialization and subject matter expertise. And so it's very difficult, I think, for any company to be a generalist and try and be something for everyone and then talk about how they're different. And so what happens is you have to compete on price because that's the only place you can really differentiate. And that is a slippery slope unless you want to be, you know, the Kmart of your industry. So, you know, I, I, I can give you, I don't even know if Kmart of exists anymore. Is Kmart, is Kmart uh, I, I rest my, I rest my case. <laughs> right, exactly. right. Yeah. Um, you know, there are a lot of times when I think a business and, and we work in this space, again, both on the agency side and the AMI side, but, you know, we had a, we had an agency that we had been working with agency was about 30 years old, uh, was very much a generalist for its first 20 years, kind of served the local butcher, baker and candlestick maker. They were in a state that had a lot of tourism kind of things. So they had some specialties they had, they ended up having when we sort of looked at where they already had a concentration of clients, you know, they had some tourist stuff, they had some financial things, and they had uh, two or three higher ed clients. So we went through an exercise um, and really thought about where they could differentiate themselves, both what are the skill sets inside the agency that would lend themselves to a certain vertical. And anyway, long story short, um, they decided to go all in on higher ed, but higher ed is not an industry niche. Higher ed is an entire freaking industry, right? So what they did was they said, you know what, we're going to work with private colleges with less than 5,000 students. We are very super niche. Like these, we're going to help these people. And we've got the digital chops to help them recruit the right applicants and yada, yada, yada. So within 18 months, so they launched some thought leadership things again, um, really right out of what we teach. Um, they launched a podcast. They started producing some content. They started going to very specific trade shows, exhibiting, talking about, have, they really polished off some case studies that they had done for that, that super uh, defined niche. And within 18 months, the largest client in the agency's history was one that came in through their website because they had heard the podcast invited them to an RFP, and they won that piece of business. And today, 95% of their clients are in the niche, and they have more than doubled in size in less than three years. All Honestly, all because of their focus on the niche and their understanding that it was their job to teach through their marketing things that would be valuable to the marketing folks at these you know, small private colleges that they would build a community of these people who would look to them as a subject matter expert. And when those folks needed an agency, they were like, oh, I know who to call because I've already been getting their email. I've already listened to their podcast. I've already engaged with them at a trade show. Why wouldn't I call them? I know them. I joke around, Drew. I say everything good in my life goes back to a podcast episode uh, wow. relationship wise besides my wife. Okay. Uh, I was met my say, business partner. Right. I mean, I know someone, one of my friends who actually met his wife through his podcast also. So wow. it happens. It wow. happens. Um, but I love what you said there, which is, you know, it's really focusing in and niching down and figuring out who your 
who do you want to serve, who your best right. clients are, who do you deliver the best results for, and what's the skill right. sets around that? Do you do with that particular person or anyone? Did you find they were resisting that because there's this push pull there, which is, well, if I go really all in on this, then I'm missing out on this, and there's that like fear of missing out. How, how did how did you help them get around, get off the mindset of? Well, we still serve these other three really right. well, and right. you you know you you're not a you know what I'm talking about, yeah, right? Yeah. So how do you get them to, or maybe you didn't suggest right away going all in, but I'm curious of how they got their mindset around that that they're missing out on other niches. Yeah, so uh, I think the, I think the distinction first of all, there is not a business owner on the planet that likes to have someone walk into their office with a big bag of money and send them on their merry way, taking the bag of money with them. That's just counterintuitive to how we're wired, right? Because we know there are, are moments of feast and there are moments of famine. And anytime you can grab a bag of money that stretches out the famine, all the better. You get to keep paying your people. You don't have to lay people off. You don't have to do all the hard things, which make most people not want to own a business, right? But I think, I think the distinction is, and what I have said to them and every other client that I've walked through this with, here's the deal. If somebody walks into your office with a big bag of money and they're not one of these small private colleges and you can actually serve them, take their money. But in terms of how you present yourself and how you go out to market, the only people you care about are these private colleges. All of your marketing, all of your content, all of your social channels, all you're going to talk about is private college, private college, private college. If a bank happens to walk in the door and wants to hire you because you know, their cousins with one of your account execs and whatever, or they've known you for 20 years because you've been in the chamber together, take their money until we get to the point that 75% of your revenue is coming from the niche. And then you have enough confidence to start saying no, right? So it's very different inbound versus outbound in the beginning, that it is an evolution, not a revolution. And we're going to slowly build up the book of business in our area of specialty to the point where we are perfectly comfortable saying no to the bank because we know there's three colleges around the corner and we are so much more effective and efficient when we stay in our lane. At a certain point in time, the business owner goes, oh, I see the value of this. My people don't have to understand 12 different industries or my equipment doesn't have to make 50 different things. Like if I just make really this one widget, thing. yeah. Everything gets more streamlined. It, it helps me know exactly who to sell to, what events to go to, uh, what my content strategy is, what kind of people I want to hire, what expertise I want them to have. It just makes everything in a world where nothing is simple, which is true about business ownership. It makes it simple. I'd love for you to walk me through, I, you know, not necessarily there's a checklist, but your methodology of what, if someone's listening to to us right now and they're like, yes, like, that's what I want. I, right. I haven't been able to accomplish that. I know I have whatever, four different types of clients or five, or maybe I don't know. What is some of the thought process they should go through to narrow it down to get to their private college of less than 5,000 students? What are some of the things that they should think about? Yeah. Uh, yep. Cool. So go ahead. All right. So um, I have, um, I've built kind of a criteria for figuring this out. Right. And so here are some of the questions that the, so it's basically an Excel spreadsheet and it lists my criteria and then it has room for five different, I think this might be our niche. And you give yourself a letter grade for each of these questions and it does the math for you and you goes, well, duh, this is what it is. Hang on a second. The UPS guy's about to go ahead. Or this is such a critical question that I actually have developed a tool that um, people can sort of self-assess. So picture an Excel spreadsheet, because that's what it is. And the first column is the criteria. And then I've left room for you for five potential niches. And what you're going to do is you're going to read the criteria and give yourself a letter grade A through F. And then, and you're going to do that with numbers, which is in the key on the, on the criteria sheet. And then you're going to, the math is going to tell you where you should belong. So here's some of the criteria. We already have extensive experience in this niche. Number one, uh, we have the skills to deliver what they need. We already have compelling case studies in this niche. Generic case studies are not meaningful 
to your audience. They want to know you've already done it for someone that looks just like them, right? There are between 500 and 10,000 prospects in this niche. So here's the thing. Everyone thinks I'm going to say healthcare is my niche. That is not a niche, right? If there it could be than, dentists, it could be hospitals, right, it could right. be well, it could be rural hospital systems, yeah, it could uh, be whatever it is, but you've got to have a, a list that is manageable enough that you actually can be a subject matter expert in that. So, you know, healthcare, I, I'm not an expert in pharma, I'm not an expert in healthcare management inside hospitals or, you know, uh, long-term care. Like you've got to narrow the niche. So for most businesses, unless you sell a $5 thing, you don't need 20,000 clients. You don't even want 20,000 clients. So, you know, if they've got, if this niche has between 500 and 10 or 15,000 prospects, if you could buy a list that would have that many, you're going to have plenty of opportunity there, right? But you don't want one that's 150,000 on the list because what that means is you haven't narrowed down enough, all right? So uh, the next one, ironically, is we could buy a list of prospects in this niche. Like, this is a group of people or businesses that I can identify in some way. Uh, these prospects gather together. So conferences, trade shows, whatever that may be. Um, how many other businesses already claim this position? So in my world, the sheet says how many other agencies, but you could translate that. So if everybody else on the planet already says, you know, for example, you, you couldn't throw a stone in any city and not hit an agency that has a bank as a client, right? So bank, a bank, financial institutions, not a niche. But small community banks in communities smaller than X, great niche. Um, do we have current clients in this niche that would safely give us a referral? Uh, do we have a strong point of view in working with this niche? So I told you at MMG, our strong point of view is you people are spending your marketing dollars backwards right? And at AMI, our strong point of view is most agency owners are accidental business owners. They're great at serving clients, but they have no idea how to actually run the business of their business. And that's what we teach them how to do, how to make money and keep money and keep more of the money they make and all of that sort of thing. So we have a strong point of view. Uh, and the next one is I, the owner and my team could get excited about this work. Because a niche is not a one and done like you do it for a year. It's like, I'm going to be doing this. You know, I think about my world. I am going to be serving agencies until I'm ready not to work anymore. That's a long time. So I got to be, I got to be able to get up for that every day and be like, yeah, this is going to be great. Uh, and then we can happily serve this niche for 10 plus years. And the niche is recession proof. So those are the criteria. And um, you know, if you, if you answer honestly, sort of where your business is at on all of those, then honest, honestly, it's not figuring out the niche, it's having the courage to do it. That's where people get stuck. Totally. Yeah. And um, I don't know if there's a page of the Agency Management Institute we should send people to, or just go to the, go to the actual website itself. Um, I don't know if there's a, a good place for that niche, if they just go to the blog or the podcast, is there a particular page we should send people to or just send them to the main website for that in particular? Yeah, hang on. Um, yes, there is. All right. What? Yeah, if they just go to agencymanagementinstitute.com backslash niche criteria, you can download the Excel document. Cool. Yeah, so go to backslash niche criteria and you'll see the Agency Management Institute uh, site linked up. Uh, yeah. on this episode. So, um, you know, thanks for sharing that. That's really, sure. really valuable. I don't know, you know, I myself find it super valuable. I don't know if people realize how valuable that is because when you're speaking, it goes back into direct response copywriting. I mean, if right. you're speaking directly to a person and they feel like you're speaking to them. Right. And all, know, and all your examples sound like them and your referral sources look like them. They go, and you know what, this is probably more true now than ever before. So, you know, we are coming out of the pandemic and I will tell you the agencies that rebounded the fastest were the specialists because when businesses had money to spend, they had no margin of error. So they didn't want a generalist. You know, it's sort of like the analogy I use all the time. If you had a brain tumor, you would not go to your general practitioner to remove that. 
you would get on a plane and fly to Mayo Clinic if you don't happen to live in Rochester, Minnesota, to get that thing taken out. And you would want a brain tumor specialist from Mayo Clinic to do that work. That's the same thing for all of us. If you are a generalist, number one, you're geographically bound because why am I going to drive past four of you to get to you, right? You're all the same. Like, you know, it's like a, a oil change. Why would I drive past four Jiffy Lubes to get to Lube Fast if they're pretty much the same? But we will literally, uh, we did some research last year and we asked about a thousand agency clients if their agents geographically, where was their agency located in relation to them? And, and the bigger the client, the less likely the agency was a local agency. They picked them because of their expertise, not because of their geography. And this was pre-pandemic, but I think that we're going to see even more of that now that you know we all live on Zoom every day, right? I don't really care if my agency is in town anymore or my fill in the blank, whatever, whatever your listener's business is, you can expand your geography unless you deliver, like if you're a plumber, odds are you cannot expand your geography. But especially if you're a B2B service provider, there's no reason why all your clients have to be in the same geography as you if you give someone a reason to drive past four other people like you to get to you. Yeah, unless you're the plumber for like the Japanese 572 model that are on all the mansions in, you know, right. the three surrounding states, then they'll right. call you in to fix that thing. Well, you know what? I, I just bought a new dishwasher. And as I was buying it, the guy goes, um, the one thing you need to know is there's one guy in the state who works on these dishwashers. So, and I was like, show me a different dishwasher. <laughs> exactly. But, That's right? my, that but, would be my but, next but, statement. But this yeah. guy, he's a specialist in this kind of dishwasher. And he was like, yeah, sometimes it takes 30 days. I was like, no, no, I, I don't care that much about the dishwasher brand. I'll switch. But when it comes to something important to your business, you do care enough and you are willing to work with somebody out of market who can provide for you a depth of expertise and counsel that a generalist just can't do. Yeah, no, I love that. It's such an important exercise. I appreciate you yeah. sharing that and people can check it out on the website. Um, Drew, the other thing I was going to ask is, you know, through the Agency Management Institute, you've helped a lot of um, agencies. And there was one in particular that, um, so I'd love to share what some of the takeaways were of this person. Um, it's around a 50 person staff. And they had said oh, they yeah. went from 8% profit to 22% profit. So right. what were some of the ideas, suggestions and advice? And I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So as I was telling you before we hit the record button, this is an agency that started listening to the podcast, ended up coming to a workshop and began implementing some of the things we teach at our workshop on the podcast in some of our content on the website. Uh, we produce videos every week. And honestly, a lot of it was around one of the things that most business owners, unless they have an MBA or they have an accounting background, most business owners aren't great at business math. And in our world, in the agency world, there's very specific math and metrics that no generalist accountant is going to show you. And so what we do in our workshops is we teach agency math. And so this owner and one of his right-hand people came to a couple of our workshops and we walked them through, basically, here's how you build a dashboard for your agency. Here are the four or five numbers you need to look at. If they're all green, your agency is healthy. The minute one of them turns yellow or red, you have a problem. And depending on what number, here's where you go to look to resolve the problem. And so honestly, what we did for them, for the most part, was give them a financial management set of tools that allowed them to, for example, in every business, when things get busy, your employees come to you and say, we need to hire more people. Got to have more people. And most owners look around and they go, well, everybody seems pretty busy, so maybe we should hire someone. Well, at AMI, we're like, nope, that's not the way that works. If you don't have $150,000 of AGI, so that's gross billings minus your cost of goods, if you don't have $150,000 of AGI or adjusted gross income for every employee, you can't hire another person. So all of a sudden, we took something very subjective and made it objective. So we have a bunch of those that we taught them that all of a sudden, they basically started running their business by the numbers. And when you run your business by the numbers, the number on the bottom gets bigger. Hmm. 
I would love to hear, you know, you've seen yourself personally and from your, you know, experience through helping the other agencies, some of the big challenges and mistakes. I'd love to hear, mm-hmm. you know, what do you see? Do you see certain people hit up against a certain plateau and how they get to the next level, like whether it's staff or revenue, like, oh, to go from 20 to 50 staff, things have changed or a million to 5 million or whatever criteria you have. What are some of those roadblocks you've seen people, once they get over that hump, it takes them to the next level? Yeah, I think one of the biggest challenges for business owners is a very human uh, issue, which is we tolerate mediocre employees. And when we are small enough that we think of our business as the family and we refer to it as, oh, we're very family oriented, blah, 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 blah. It's kind of hard to fire your kid or your uncle, right? But what happens is in a business of 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 people, you know, you have one person that's a C player. That has pretty dramatic impact on the business's performance. And even worse, it makes the A players and the B players go, you know what? I'm not working this hard anymore. I'm tired of covering for this person. Clearly my boss doesn't care that this person comes in late or is not prepared or whatever it is that they don't do at the level you want them to. And, and they, and what happens is the employees sit there and they go, okay, I'm going to watch and see how long it takes through to fix this. And the more time it takes, the more respect you lose from your, actually your great contributors. And so a big change for for business owners, and I certainly see it among my agency owners, is when they can transcend from family to team and they can separate the personal from the professional. I can fire someone and still care about them as a human being. I can still, you know, want to make sure that their kids are happy. Like I can still care about them, but if I'm not really clear, and this is the other issue, I, a lot of business owners have a very passive aggressive communication style. We're not clear about our expectations. We're not clear about the consequences when those expectations are not followed. And then even if we have been clear, we don't actually execute on the consequence because you know what, she's got three kids and they're all in college. Like we tell ourselves this horrible story. And then what we end up doing is our business starts to erode and we start losing our best performers we end up taking less money out of the business because we're having to shore up around this person. And, you know, I have agencies that honest to God, they've had the, they've had the wrong person in the seat for 15 or 20 years. They know it. They have eight workarounds to work around Babette, but they will not fire her. And so a lot of my job is like, help me understand what she would actually have to do for you to (laughs) fire her. Like, would she have to kill your dog in front of you? Like, what would it, what would it take? And, you know, just sort of talking to them about the cost. But honestly, I have clients that we work with that I can't get them to budge off of that, that they have, they have such displaced loyalty to this employee that they are willing to risk all the other employees in the business to not make this difficult decision. And I'm not suggesting it's easy. And I'm not suggesting we should fire people willy nilly. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying it's our obligation to have an expectation of our employees and to hold them to those expectations. True. In that situation, let's say it's part real, part hypothetical. Um, would you suge- how would you suggest that person handle it? Um, would you suggest they let the person go or do you suggest they try and find another seat for them? How would you navigate that if you were to, they're like, okay, Drew, I'm ready to go. Like, I know I've not listened to you for the past 10 years. Yeah. I'm ready to listen. Like, give me the, Give me the roadmap for this. Typically, they maybe we'll already, send it to that person. T- typically, you know. they've already had several seats on the bus, right? Like they've already tried to like, oh, I'm going to put them here. That didn't work. Oh, I'm going to put them over here. Like they've already occupied several seats. They just need to get off the bus. So, you know, I, I yes, I think at a certain point in time, what you do is you sit down and you say, you know what? I have done you a disservice. I have not been really clear about my expectations. And I need to, I apologize that I have not set you up to be successful, but I am changing that today. And I want to be really clear about my expectations. I'm going to be very clear about the timeline and I'm going to be very clear about the consequences if you can't, if you can't or choose not to meet my expectation. So I think that's how the conversation starts, that you own, that you've been a lousy manager, right? And you haven't really set them up to be successful. So number one, that. 
Then it's like, here are my expectations. They have to be measurable. They have to be able to prove, you know, it can't be something subjective. It's got to be like this, these five things have to happen. They need to happen within a 90 day period. You and I are going to meet every other Friday to talk about your progress, to coach you through, I want you to be successful. But at the end of the 90 days, if we have not checked all five of these boxes, I am going to let you go. So you're warning them 90 days in advance. And and one of two things will happen. And I've had both happen in my own company with this. In one case, the guy looked at me and said, I had no idea I was letting you down. I will accomplish these things. And he stayed with me another 10 years. And he was one of my best employees. He just got off the path. But I have also had people go, I'm not doing that. So I quit. Okay. Or they start looking for a job and they quit somewhere in the 90 days. But in either case, you either have a good employee or you have a a spot on the bus for a good employee. Yeah, that's great. Um, it's really, you're, you're giving them a shot, right? right under right. the, under because the pretense of, expe- you know, get a setting clear expectations right. and objectives. And that, that way they have, a, they basically can do it or not do it. Right. It's, it's now their choice because they're grownups. They get to make that choice. And you're not going to, it's not like you're just saying, go do it. And you're not helping them. You're going to coach them through. You're going to meet with them on a regular basis. Or you're going to get someone else to help them if you don't have the skill set to help them. But you're going to you're going to give them a shot. And what you're saying is, I've messed this up, so I'm going to give you a shot to redeem yourself. But this is both of, for both of us. This is our last shot. Love it. Um, first of all, Drew, I want to thank you. And I have one last question before I ask it. I want to point everyone to check out the agency management Institute.com to learn more, check out the build a better agency podcast to learn more. Um, any other places online that we should point people towards? I I'm on all the social channels and I'm happy to connect with folks. And my last name is spelled M C capital L E L L A N. So if you just look for Drew McClellan, pretty much everywhere that you're going to find me. Yeah. So, you know, last question is who are some of the companies or leaders in the, you know, it doesn't have to be agency industry in general that you really respect, whether it's their books, their work, what they're doing that, that we should all consider learning from as well. Cause I know you've probably, you know, uh, you have friends uh, or colleagues that you really respect and you've, you know, over the past decades. Yeah. So the first place I always point folks is there's an author and sort of a management coach uh, by the name of Steve Farber. So Steve's first book was called uh, Radical Leap, and then he wrote Radical Edge, and he's written several other books. His latest book is called uh, Love is Damn Good Business. And And really what he teaches is how do you manage people and how do you grow a business from a position of, of love? And I think it's brilliant. Um, his earlier books are all business fables, so they're easy to read, but, um, I read, I read his work early as an, as a business owner and a, I was relieved to align with it already, but B, I learned a ton from it. So I would say that, um, there's another guy out there named Joe Calloway who, um, has written some great books, uh, and has some great presentations online again about leadership and management. At the end of the day how we show up in our business is going to determine our business's success or failure. It, it is dependent on us. And it's not so much our skill set. It's really about what we're willing, how far out on the limb we're willing to go. What kind of risks are we willing to take? How do we get, invite people to participate in those risks in a way that they want to follow us? You know, that's at the end of the day, that's at least from an employee perspective, how we grow our business. Thank you, Drew. And who's a good fit to check out and join the Agency Management Institute? Yeah, we work with independently owned agencies, so none of the big holding companies. Most of our agencies are under 100 people, um, and a lot of them are under 20, 25 people. Uh, all over the world, we have. Uh, you can join one of our virtual peer groups. If you're outside of the U.S., we have live peer groups. Uh, you know, we have workshops all the time, so you don't have to be a member to attend one of those workshops. Our goal is just to be as big and helpful a resource as we possibly can to that independent agency owner who's saying, We're, we take great care of our clients, but I can't figure out why I'm not making more money. 
that's typically that's how the entry point to somebody coming to find us. Everyone check out agencymanagementinstitute.com. Check out more episodes of inspiredinsider.com. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Thanks for Drew. having me. You bet. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.